everyone and welcome to the SBK Cheltenham preview podcast and we'll be focusing on day one for this one and yeah we well we've made it as the Cheltenham festival is only days away and so it will would be sort of rude not to have another festival preview to add to your mighty list of options there is out there to those who have been with us since the start of the National Hunt season, I hope you have got involved in some of the standout tipping moments that have come from the pundits on this podcast. As week after week, it, we have delivered some mighty punts. So no pressure, team. I bigged you up as you're all far too modest to do it yourself. So let's get rolling for what, the one that really matters because everything else doesn't. And it's all about this. James Norman, Ross Miller, Tom K- Collins. Uh, great to have everyone back and we're going to start obviously as I said with Tuesday where it will where it all begins and the first race has delivered for us a mouth-watering start to the festival for 2022 a significant race for this podcast for so many reasons widely debated about who will line up and the market is suggesting Willie Mullins will send Dyser Dynamo here and the betting as it's Stands today looks like this. Constitution Hill, 27 to 10 favourite. Dysert Dynamo, as I said, looking like they're leaning to this race at 41 to 10. John Bond, 49 to 10. So Gerhard perhaps will go to the Ballymore, 31 to 5. Kilcrup, 39 to 5. Mighty Potter, 9 to 1. And 28 to 1, bigger the rest. So look, uh, there's still a bit of water to go under the bridge yet. This is a really tricky one because the whole complexion of this race could be very different if Sir Gerhard does run in this. Uh, I'm going to start with James. You've been off for a little bit. I know the uh, the, the the Storm Eunice gave a bit of a demolition job to your Wi-Fi, but you're fresh off a break. So I'm going to come to you first. And as I said, will they, won't they send, send Sir Gerhard to this race? As this could really throw this race either wide open or make it something very different. Yeah, so Willie won't he, isn't it, with Willie Mullins? And you're never going to know, really, until Sunday morning and he clicks that declare button at 10 to 10 because I think Segard wins whatever race he goes for. So, I'm, personally, I'm not actually that worried. Um, I've been impressed with, with especially his hurling debut at Leopardstown on Boxing Day. I think the first time in front of a big crowd, perhaps that could have been what just stays a little bit, yet the form's still strong. He destroyed Free Stripe Life and Co. quite nicely as well, spread out in behind him. I suppose the question mark for Willie Mullins, he's got two good chances. Nicky's got two good chances. This Supreme looks to be a, a very hot race. And for me, Desert Dynamo probably won't stay or won't settle well enough to stay in the Ballymore. Whereas Sir Gerhard, I think if they choose to, to run him in the Ballymore, he would settle well enough. Why he's obviously very much quick enough for the Supreme. Whatever race he goes for, I'm not too worried. Constitution Hill, I mentioned it when we discussed the actually anti post. Uh, options for this contest. Queen of the Stage, a dam trained by Nick and Jane Williams, loved soft ground. She was particularly good at sand down. Got Susan Neils had two runs at sand down. Good to soft, heavy ground. Is he going to be as effective at Cheltenham on? Probably. You never know with the weather forecast. A slightly quicker surface and a race at a higher tempo. So I'm not quite a strong punch Susan Hill. John Bomb. Mm. Is he going to have the temperament to cope with the the, the pressure of the Chant Festival and, and the roar of the opening race? That's a question mark for him. And like I say, does it Dynamo? If he took on Sir Gerhard, I wouldn't be too worried about him because he's just such a keen going individual. So for me, wherever Sir Gerhard goes, I'm going for him. So I'm not looking beyond him. Um, and we'll leave we'll leave to decide what he wants to do on Sunday morning. Dice at Dynamo comes into us with not a huge amount of race course experience. What has he beaten? That's my Concern for him as well. Perhaps you could say the same for Constitution Hill. But looking at these top key pretenders who normally come to the fore in this kind of race, it's uh, it, it's it's they're kind of all got similar sort of profiles. If Sir Gerhard doesn't run, because he's the horse with the plenty of race course experience and the Cheltenham experience too. Yeah, it's going to be a really good race. I'm looking forward to it. The Supreme is the race everyone seems to get most excited about just because it's the first race of the festival. Obviously, there are better races to come, uh, more proven commodities. But this is going to be a thrilling heat, even if Sir Gerhard doesn't turn up. Um, we've already touched on both Nicky Henderson's runners. I think Constitution Hill is the best of the, the duo. However, I am very concerned about the, the form of the yard. A lot has been made of the form of Henry de Bromhead over the last few months, but I haven't seen that much talk about Nicky Henderson. But when you look at his stats in February, it's his lowest total uh, tally of winners since 1997. Um, He's had 53 runners, which is around average for the month, but he's only had seven winners. That's a massive negative for me. One from 22 in the last two weeks. Um, I think you've got to be a bit 
cautious about his runners at the moment. Obviously, there's still seven or eight days until the start of the festival. So, you know, the yard could find form. But I'm just a bit wary. And for that reason, I want to be opposing his runners in the opener, especially at the prices. Uh, they both got great chances, but as I say, just for the yard form. Uh, my selection is Dysart Dy Dynamo. As you mentioned, he hasn't beaten much. Um, in fact, he's probably got the weakest form in terms of who he's beaten out of all of the protagonists in the race. However, in my opinion, he's the energamine of the Novice Herding division. He's just got an incredibly high cruising speed. He jumps fluently. He can get many of these rivals off the bridle early on. And I think that could be enough for Dysart Dynamo. Uh, we've seen it in the past with Willie Mullins' horses in the Supreme. They go to the front and dominate. Classical Dream being one, Duvan, Votour. Um, I think Dysart Dynamo could be the next. Yeah, it's interesting you say about those stats for Nicky Henderson. He didn't have a great year last year as well, coming into the Cheltenham Festival 2. I'm looking at them now quickly. I think 10 winners in February 2021, very similar to February 2022 of seven. But, I mean, you guys all know where I'm sitting with this race, and I just think that the, the class horses... It doesn't matter how the rest of the form of the yard is is faring. Uh, Dysart Dynamo, I was looking back at the 2016 running of this race when Min was their big hope and he was quite a keen running sort. He he went out and bowled along and was very forthright in the hands of, of Ruby Walsh. I could see him probably being a bit like uh, Min. And it's just whether he's he's just quite ready for this this test of this nature. Ross, I'll, I'll come to you next because I know you're really excited to see Constitution Hill bound up the hill for the Supreme Novice Hurdle. You've been waiting for this. So uh, how, how, how excited are you for this moment? I'm, I'm excited for the race. Um, and, and it looks like we you know, reports are they're leaning towards probably soft ground for the start of the, of the festival. So I think Nikki probably will now switch from the Ballymore to the, to the Supreme with Constitution Hill and you'll, you'll get your wish. Um, but I, I, I've got bad news. I'm with Tom. And I think we're one from nine when we agree. Um, <laughs> I I just think Dysart Dynamos bet the knees by by a good bit. You ask what he's beaten, and and I understand what you're saying, but the the fact of the matter is that the little Yank who was in third last time is 129 rated. He was 50 lengths behind. Gringo de Orbrel is uh, 130 rated. Was 20 lengths behind. They might have not run to their mark, but Dysart Dynamo didn't come off the bridle. He's yet to come off the bridle. I think he'll bounce out in front, and I don't think they'll get anywhere near him. Um, I, I, I really don't. I think he'll definitely run in this and I think he has got a great chance. Also, I can't see why Constitution Hill isn't, doesn't have exactly the same profile. He hasn't come off the bridle either. Yes, off ground and deep conditions is what he seemed to have really relished. But I just don't see it to be too much of a, of a necessary problem if he's going to get soft ground, as you say, it will... It will be, Ross, on the first day, the first race. It's always soft ground. It has been soft ground, even probably worse than that. And um, that's what they need to have it to start on for the first four days. He's looked so good. His temperament, the manner, the style that he he cruises into his races. He reminds me of what Altior uh, was like um, at that stage of his career. And I think the vibes are extremely positive for this horse. And I'm putting all my faith that he begins my week in a brilliant way. We're going to head into the Arkle Chase next, um, run over two miles for the Novice Chasers. And hopefully, uh, from an English perspective, this could be with two favourites, Andy Post as it stands, uh, could be quite a, uh, a, a nice uh, first step into the festival. Edward Stone for Alan King is five to two favourite as it stands. Um, River Detail, Blue Lord, 21 to 5, Third Time Lucky, your old friend Tom, 7 to 1, Horton Colour, 9s with St. Sam, Magic Day, 25 to 2, 13 to 1 for Curse of Blind, Jungle Boogie, 49 to 1, and Sildan Edge, 99 to 1. He's got other options too. Not a massive field. I could see this cutting up a bit. Edward Stone taken to fences like a duck to water after that being brought down on his first go. And it's weather. And I'll come, James, back to you first, whether really the form and, and how impressive he's been in the UK against UK horses can stand up against the Irish rivals. Yes. And for me, this is the one race where I think the English novices are not that far off the two mile Irish novices. And ultimately, he's pulled well clear of his competition over here. Third time lucky. I know Mr. TC has been banging his head against the bricks wall, seeing that horse run so often. But. For me, Edward Stone's a better horse anyway, even if uh, the skeletons kept him a little bit fresher. And I felt 
Uh, he got a nice ride around her up last time at Warwick. Edwardstone was still much the best. And I've just been seriously impressed. You had slight negative. He's an eight-year-old. He hasn't got a great record in the Arkle. He had a go at chasing uh, last campaign. Unfortunately, he received his rider early on and they were sensibly sent him back over hurdles. And while he was always quite keen over hurdles, what's impressed me most this year of fences is not just his capabilities over the bigger obstacles. It's the fact he's actually grown up. I think keeping him over hurdles for another season, running him in the Betfair, fifth uh, in the county behind Belfast Bound when he got beaten three lengths, third at Aintree. He learned a lot in those big field handicap hurdles. And this year in a small field, very competitive chases. He just looked um, the complete article. And then I was very impressed at uh, Kempton. I think actually it was probably my most impressed with him. Um, and they had to say, run him at, at uh, Warwick in the Kingmaker. I think Alan King was worried he'd get too fresh if he just freshened him up and went straight to Cheltenham. Realistically, the Irish, they're a little bit much of a muchness. I, I wasn't that impressed with the Irish article uh, where Blue Lord came out on top. River to tell, bad mistake at the last um, or the came down. St. Sam's very, very keen. The four of them, there's not a great deal between that four, whereas Edward Stone, for me, is, is well clear of his uh, British opposition. Uh, and I think it could well be a, a British winner uh, for day one of the meeting. So Edward Stone is, is quite confident for me. I liked him straight after Kempton and, and Sandown, and he's done nothing wrong since. So uh, Edward Stone for me. Yeah, the... Looking through Cheltenham form is always important for if you for a novice if they've been around the track and actually a lot of the horses in in the top section of the market have actually given the Cheltenham a go before Edwardstone is not from three but Tom your old friend is one around Cheltenham um, and and it, and that's a, that's a positive for him against the others are you going to restore your faith can he reverse the form with Edwardstone. No, I'm surprised that Dan Skelton didn't find the race last week at Kelso for him. Um, he seems to be running him every week when he should have given him a, a few months rest. Uh, third time luck, he's not on my radar this year. I still think he's a very sharp prospect for next season if they keep him fresh, um, but I will be opposing him. I think Edward Stone is the horse to beat. He should be five from five over fences this season. He's run to a mark of 164 in his last three occasions. He needs to run five pounds higher to win an average running of the Arkle, but that's perfectly plausible given the pace set up in this heat. Um, he's a short price favourite. Well, relatively short price favourite. He deserves to be favourite though. I'm going to take him on. I think he's most likely winner, but I think there's a value play in here each way, um, which is cause sublime. He holds an entry in the Grand Annual as well. So much like James with Sir Gerhard, if he goes to the Grand Annual, I'll be backing him there. But if he goes to the Arc, I'll also be backing him. Um, he finished second in the 2019 Triumph Hurdle when he was with Gordon Elliott. He's been largely disappointing since, which is you know a slightly off-putting, but Henry de Bromhead's team haven't been in good form this year. He's finally got his horses back in good nick. He was he appeared to have Fernie Hollow off the bridle in a seasonal reappearance. Now, that form looks pretty strong. Fernie Hollow would be second favourite, maybe favourite for this year's Arkle um, if he was running in the race. So based on that evidence, course sublime at around 13 to 1, 14 to 1 is a nice price. And last time out, I think what's crucial was how he hit the line. After the final fence, he scooted clear. It was like a flat horse. Um, he really quickened up and that was enough to, to make me think this horse could win an Arkle or at least be placed at a double figure price. Yeah, he's 13 to 1. We've had shocks and upsets in this before, put the kettle on being one a couple of years ago. And uh, that's an interesting section. Yeah, as you say, Henry de Promed's team still just struggling. Haven't had a winner yet in March, um, but uh, they like to hope they're going to come good just in time for this week that they did so well in last year. Ross, I'll come to you. Obviously, Edward Stone, it, it's brilliant to see a horse with this quality of this nature from, a, from an English perspective uh, because the... the the Shishkin won this race last year, but it, we we do struggle. We can struggle in this in this in this kind of heat. And as I mentioned, that there is it is him versus just an onslaught of Irish horses. Uh, what did you make of what James James said about about the uh, the Dublin Rest, Racing Festival race where Blue Lord and River Dettel, she was she was slightly novice at her last. Blue Lord has fallen at Cheltenham before. So there's holes to pick at them. Yeah, I thought the Irish Arca was quite a disappointing race, really. I was disappointed that Blue Lord couldn't beat her more convincingly and probably wouldn't have if she hadn't made that mistake. Um, so the Arca is usually a race I really, really look forward to, and I'm pretty lukewarm on it this year, I have to say. Um, Edward Stone is solid. He's likeable. But as Tom just said, he's run to a consistent level. And I just wonder whether is there any improvement or is he that just as good as he is? Now that might be good enough because he's 
beaten everything he's run against so far. Um, so without too much conviction, I would just be interested in chancing Horton Couleur again. I don't think he's a bad jumper. He, he fell in the Irish arc, but he just got in a bit tight and rubbed the top and, and knuckled over. Um, in his previous run, he jumped very well, a big athletic jumper. And he just struck me as being the one horse in the field that we don't yet know how good he is. He was third in last year's triumph on his first run over hurdles in the in the UK. Um, I thought that was a strong piece of form. And then he backed it up all the way through. And the Willie Mullins yard had normally quite switched on in terms of what their pecking order is. And he went off half a point bigger than Blue Lord for the Irish Arc. So I don't think they have too much between them. Um, Blue Lord is much shorter than him for this arc, so at a bigger price, I would chance him. But it's a race that I'm I'm not excited about. Yeah, he's nine to one. Tom Collins always says he can't back a horse after a fall, and I'm going to come to a one in a similar vein a bit later. But I'd imagine that's a that's a negative. And I think that if they're going to try and get their Willie Mullins try and get these novices they're jumping a little bit better, which they need to for Blue Lord, who fell at the last when he was nearly going to be second, I think it was, to appreciate it. Um, you know, they, they if any horse can improve, Blue Lord kind of, whole Uncle Lord's got a lot more improvement probably in him for something like this. I would tend to agree just slightly with Edward Stone in that it's a, it's a it's not confident enough. I just feel like he's been on the go a lot and just wouldn't want him to, I mean, obviously Alan King, absolute master. I'm sure they've got him where they want him to be, but there are slightly more unexposed types in here um, that probably have a little bit more improvement to come. And I'm just going to chance it with Blue Lord at 21 to five. I think he can be a bit better than what he showed at Leperstown. And I perhaps Cheltenham, as Willie Mullins just gets these horses spot on for it, it might just bring that out of him. Um, despite the fact that he uh, he blundered in a terrible way in the in the uh, Supreme uh, last year, so tentative for me. Uh, but that's uh, that is the Arkle Chase. Um, if uh, the betting has got it right, it'll be two 0 to the English by the time we get to the Ultima, which is also a pretty uh, pretty good race in our favour over the years. And uh, although Death Duty for Gordon Elliott leads the market, does he know is a joint favourite with him at the moment as well, fifteen to two. Uh, for the Kim Bailey team, who was second in this race last year, no, Noble Yates, 17 to 2. I write 10 to 1 with Fleur, uh, Fantasticas, 11s with Frontal Assault, pull, Fullback, Imperial Alcazar, and Schoolboy Hours. I can keep going through the betting, but we'll be here all day. Uh, so I will come back to Tom first. Let's have a chat about this. I've tried to find as many stats, and the one that everyone keeps telling us about is headgear. The nine out of the last 10 winners have headgear. We don't necessarily know who will have the headgear until declaration stage. Novices uh, with form at Cheltenham can be a key pointer. But as I said, the English have a strong record, and it seems to be all the, re the race where you can find a bit of value. So what have you unearthed? Yes, exactly. The English do have a good record in this race. The last Irish train winner was Dundor in 2006. They've only had two winners since the turn of the century as well. However, this year may be different. I think the Irish hold the key. The English uh, runners in this year's ultimate don't look too strong, in my opinion. Obviously, there's going to be a shock in at least one of these Cheltenham handicaps. The ultimate could be the one. It was last year, um, but I just struggled to find the English shock in here. However, I think Death Duty is arguably the worst favourite of the week. Now, I know that Gordon Elliott said oh, well, this horse is the best handicapped horse on the new ratings. And, you know, it blew up social media and that's why he got put into favourite. Um, but I cannot see it. He's an 11-year-old, been largely disappointing. He had one good run, bounced back last time out. That's not enough for me to back him at favourite uh, in the Ultima. So I want to be taking him on. The horse I came down on was another Henry de Bromhead trained runner. I think Henry de Bromhead's going to have an excellent first day of the Chant Festival, I should say. Um, and it's ain't that a shame. Um, it's, he's also got an entry in the Kim Muir, so he could go there. But I think he'll come to the Ultima. I think that's the better spot for this horse. Um, he was a really smart novice herder last year. He was considered pretty weak, Henry said in a uh, post-race interview. Um, they gave him the spring and the summer off the track to mature. But he's got a massive frame, so maybe he's going to get better um, as he gets older. But I think he's got plenty of ability at this stage. He's already shown it on the track. Um, and he's probably good enough to win an Ultima if he can improve three or four pounds in here. He was too keen on his return, but he stayed really nicely when he finished third to Statler, who we're going to come to later on, I imagine. Um, and then he finished distant second to Galapand de Champ at Leopardstown. Another very good effort, given how good Galapand de Champ is. Um, he was 16 lengths clear of a horse called Fleur that day, um, off level weights. Now, Fleur's in this field and is a shorter price then ain't that a shame, which makes no sense whatsoever. Um, last time out, he was chinned by a revitalised rival, but he travelled through the race beautifully. 
Um, I, I really like Ain't That a Shame here. Hopefully his inexperience won't catch him out, but he's a nice price for a trainer who's, I'm sure, going to have a very good first day of the Cheltenham Festival. Yeah, novices have done really well in this race. Four out of the last eight uh, winners have been novices. And he's also by Jeremy, a sire that hadn't had a winner at the Cheltenham Festival since our Connor last year. And then he went and had four winners, all from these, his last crop. So um, good stats pointing for Ain't That a Shame. Uh, but he will be breaking his maiden tag over fence if, if he does win this race. But uh, he's, uh, he's not a bad price because of that at 16 to one. Uh, James, this is a race that is dictated by, obviously, weights is a big part of the conversation over the last uh, week or so since they came out and the Irish uh, reassessment and what that is meant for the English runners, because a lot of them won't be able to actually get in. But one horse that will get in and if he does run, will sort of make this uh, it, it's sort of easier for a lot of horses because of his big weight is thrown on um, and uh, with a huge weight on his back but this is a, a wonderful horse that just loves Cheltenham so it would be great to have him in this field yeah the last time he won a handicap was off that mark of 164 in a similar contest and he's only going to run if Paul's happy with the ground and then what are we still eight days away forecast says it might well be too soft but against that we've discussed it already the English or the British got a cracking record the only bright light really last year one two three four five and the Ultima as TC said they've only won it twice in the turn of the century. So I'm going to stick with, with the British horses and, and if Frodon takes part, I think he's, he's a class horse and, and, and he's going to give you a great run for each other money. If he doesn't, does he know? He's a novice for Kim Bailey, loads of course form. I'd edge towards him. I'd definitely be sticking towards a British runner. And as you mentioned, we might not have that many actually in it because of the way the, the weights have been framed. But Frodon, if he turns up, I think he'll run a cracker. Yeah, he, he does love he does love it round here and it they... They turned down the Gold Cup opportunity, but they, uh, they're quite happy to give him a go off, off this big weight. Ross, thoughts on the, the English domination of this? Do you, do you read, do you look into stats? Are you kind of a man that likes to get your head too caught up in that type of that type of niche as he shakes his head? No. <laughs> you, you found, stats you found, you stats aren't for me because you're, you, you're, if someone gives you a stat, give them 10 <laughs> minutes, they can come back and find a stat to contradict themselves. So... Uh, I try and look at them on their merit. As Tom said a couple of weeks ago, every race needs to have a winner. So let's give it a go. Uh, the one thing I'd say about the, does he know the Kim Bailey horse? If you fancy him, wait to see him get to the start because he is mad to get a saddle on, to get a jockey on and to get him out onto the track. Festival with all the atmosphere, just mind him and, and watch him get to the start. He's definitely got a chance though. Um, I'm quite sweet on one here, uh, Ben Dundee. You alluded to the to the Irish tax that's um, been dished out in spades this year. Um, you know, horses getting four, five, six, seven, even eight pound more than their Irish mark. Ben Dundee runs off one four six, so only a pound above his Irish mark, and I think that's letting him in a bit lightly here. Um, as uh, Tom said, death duty is all the rage. Um, well, this horse beat death duty. Um, he's only now three pound better off. He beat him seven lengths. Um, he's got good course form two years ago in the plate, the novice chase there. Um, and that was off a of mark of 147. So he's actually a pound lower. He stayed on that day over two and a half miles, having got hampered at the second last by some fallers. Um, I think this race is tailor made for him. Um, I don't, he won't mind the ground if it's soft or, or a little bit better. He'll cope with that. Um, and I just think only a pound higher um, for, his, uh, for his Irish mark, I think, is a, is a gift. For me, there's a horse that has been around Cheltenham and has won around Cheltenham. That's Corrick Rambler. But that was my one that I was slightly concerned about because we've got a UR next to his name, which we don't like to see. Um, unseated at Ascot last time out. Does that count, Tom? He, he's the Zanza of this race, I think. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he's a bit of a nutcase and tends to plough through his fences. However, he has got loads of ability. So if he does decide to jump around this time, then uh, he's going to be a player. But uh, yeah, best of luck with that one. Yeah, well, when Ross was saying you just wait and see, um, uh, you know, with uh, does he know what he'll be like going down to the start? He'll probably be a bit similar, but I, yeah, I think listen, listen to Russell team, know how to get their horses in, in fine shape. They'll iron out any quirks if they can do. And I've just got a lot of respect for them. And he's been there, done that at Cheltenham as well this season, which I think is a big thing. And he's and he's a novice too. So that counts for him. And uh, he's not a bad price at 12 to 1 as it stands. We'll head on into the feature for uh, the Tuesday. That is the champion hurdle. 
run over two miles and it's just whether will the queen reign supreme honeysuckle she's eight to 11 she's most people's bankers for the week she's it's probably a race that not many are going to get that involved with from a betting perspective maybe in the without honeysuckle markets um james i know that in your anti-post selections adagio was a horse that you were keen on how uh, do you view him after his run uh last time uh just getting just getting chinned but a, a, a pretty decent battling effort uh wasn't it against goshen yeah my view probably hasn't changed in this contest really since we did that pre-race preview because adagio we saw him back at wink and he's had a, a little training setback in between the great wood and that's why we didn't see him for, for nearly four months and goshen was race fit he grabbed that uh favored hedge stand side as well did Goshen and it just meant that Adagio had to battle a little bit harder and I think race fitness told and we know Goshen uh, going right-handed is, is much better and, and, and he's not that far off the best so I thought it was a good return he's got loads of champion for him he ran a cracker to be second in the triumph last year cracking race in the great wood finished second off Lovingstone 12 I thought that was a brilliant effort look he probably isn't good enough to beat Honeysuckle but I think he'll be staying on nicely up the hill to claim some, some place money for me as Honeysuckle as your banker of the week she won't be mine because i like the fact that woody mullins actually missed uh dublin festival appreciate it because woody time and time again he can get them ready at the festival with no runs they can back up a year later after their previous success cavega we saw that time and time again and if he'd taken on honeysuckle 80 percent fit i think it might just have damaged his confidence but he goes there fresh and well he might give honeysuckle a bit of a race i'm not quite sure she's as good this year perhaps as what she was last year um, but obviously she's got that unblemished record. So good race. I'll be sticking at RJ each way and then hopefully he can and sneak a bit of place money up the hill. Yeah, there's two school of thoughts with Honeysuckle and that plenty viewed her win at Leperstown as a little bit more workmanlike than normal. Normal. Her last jump wasn't as fluent and there's she's beating Zana here six and a half lengths doesn't look as good as it was in beating perhaps Abracadabras by 10 lengths the year before. But her win in the Hatton's Grace, which I was lucky enough to see in the flesh, was just spine tingling. Um, and if she can reproduce anything like that, I can't believe that she can be she can be touched. But it is interesting that the views around how she performed at Leperstown. Ross, how did you see that? Do you think that she is there could be any chinks in Honeysuckle's armour or do we we always get a little bit obsessed with sort of finding them when, you know, it's actually, you know, she's, she's really just performed again and again to a very, very high standard. Um, yeah, she has. And, and she's got the beating of everything in this. We know, except appreciate it. And I love that Paul Townend came in, I think, after the Irish champion. Was, I can't wait to have a go on her, her with the big lad. Um, I think that's great. And I think going there fresh is a advantageous because it's going to be a fresh horse but also Henry de Bromhead Rachel uh, Blackmore they're not going to know how to beat appreciate it they're going to have to think on their on their feet and I think it will be a tactical race uh, Zana here um, and not so sleepy are, are bound to to make it um, mm. I could see Paul Townend making a early bid for home sort of coming around the bend um, I think Rachel Blackmore is certainly smarter than me and I'm sure she'd probably be aware of that and she's quite smart at Cheltenham at locking people up you know when when the leaders are coming back she's very good at getting on the outside and keeping you know keeping those horses in um she did it last year with um she got Harry Cobden tucked in on Brave Man's Game and Paul Tannen had nowhere to go on uh, Gayard de Domain Hill in the in the Ballymore so um I think he'll want to go early I think he'll want Honeysuckle to come and chase him down and I agree with James. I wasn't impressed with her from the last to the line in the Irish champion hurdle. I thought she just was treading water. Now it could be she's getting older and she could tread water and she's, you know, mm. she's not got that sort of uh, desire of youth anymore. And she was idling a little bit in front, but I went back in her odds on, I, I probably won't have a bet in the race, but if I had a free bet, it'd probably be appreciate it. Um, but I'm looking forward to watching it. I think it's a fascinating heat. It sounds like James and Ross are sort of on the same page with Honeysuckle in terms of what we saw from her last time. I disagree. I think that she is unstoppable and unbeatable and the race will set up for her quite nicely uh, in a way that Fernie Holly Hollow was able to be appreciated it in the bumper, just sort of take it, take her time and, and land there. Where 
where are you how do you view her in 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 what for so long has been sort of her race to lose if anything yeah I mean she's 14 from 14 two from two at Cheltenham I was impressed with her last time in the Irish champion I doubt she was 100% ready for that came off a 70-day absence Henry de Bromhead knew that she probably didn't have to be 100% to win the race right why get her primed for that the Irish champion when you can get her even better for the uh, normal champion hurdle at, at Cheltenham. Uh, I sometimes think when there's an odds on favourite, we look to scrape the barrel and find something to beat it, um, whether it be a he or she. And I think Honeysuckle mm-hmm. is a champion. There is no point, in my opinion, to oppose her. I'm not an each way punter when there's a race with a clear standout. If I'm betting each way, I think I want to be betting this horse because they could finish in the places, but also they've got a chance of winning. In this race, I don't think anything at a bigger price has a chance of winning. I think if Honeysuckle turns up, which Hopefully she will. Nothing to go wrong in the next seven days. Then I think she'll just win the champion hurdle again. Yeah, I, I love your confidence, Tom. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. There's, uh, I, I can't see her getting beaten either. Opu is the sort of un, uh, un, he's sort of a little joker in the pack because we don't really know the limits of his abilities. He could be put straight in his place, but he's going down the Espoir Dalian route. He was really good last time in a in an open company against his elders. He's come right in from as big as 20s to 19 to 2. And I think that Gordon Elliott, I said this in the in our anti post podcast, he's not one to be scared of one horse. And he could he could be he could probably be chasing her. But I think he's just about each way value at the moment. But honeysuckle for me as 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 with Tom, uh, James and Ross, it's just slightly a bit more tentative with her. Uh, so we'll see how the big, the feature pans out. We'll head on now to the 410, the mare's hurdle over two mile, four furlongs. N- probably not the strongest. Tell me something, girl, was winner of the net mare's novice last year. She's 72 favourite. She hasn't had a perfect campaign so far this season. Stormy Ireland was a winner at the at Cheltenham, uh, perhaps lucky in doing so, but she's she proved herself against the boys at least. She's six to one. Queensbrook 31 to 5. Burning Victory, she's got other options as well. She's 33 to 5. Constitution 12. Big and 13 to 1. Bigger the rest. James, I'll come back to you first. Personally, not a race that I get too over excited about. Um, I think a lot of these mares can sort of hit form, come back, turn, come back into form. I haven't really been overly excited by any of these. Am I right or am I wrong? No, I would totally agree there. It's not a race particularly on my radar when we got so many good mares going for the actual main championship races this time around. Uh, tell me something, girl, though. She won nicely in the mares novice here last year. For me, uh, I expect the whole season has been geared towards coming back to Cheltenham. I thought that was a good effort given £5 to Royal Kahala. Yes, she got beaten, but she only got beat a length and a quarter. Off levels on this occasion, if Royal Kahala heads here, uh, she likes Cheltenham. And Henry de Bromhead's team are just running into that nice bit of form now. So she's the one for me. Um, yeah, the mares hurdle. We had um, a few years back when um, Annie Sackler herself and then Rachel Rachel Road. It was, it was great to watch, but this year there's, there's not as much classy mares as such. Um, so I'm totally with you on that. But I do think Tell Me Something Girl could be a, a, a nice one to go in with. Yeah, seventy-two as I said. Um, not not hasn't won yet this season, which just goes to prove what, what a weak favourite that really is. Um, so. Uh, confidence behind her sort of re- returning to form at this track Ross for you um thoughts on this I know we this is these kind of races we I think throughout the season we don't see we don't really get stuck into the form as much with these horses because we're always uh going for our bigger better quality handicaps and things like that but has any of them shown you something that they could that they could uh that they could be winning here yeah I agree with both yourself and James it's not the most exciting race but I, I struggle to see Tell Me Something Girl as favourite, or I certainly would be back in her as favourite. There's a lot of guesswork. You know, her season's been geared around this. Well, it's not a handicap, so why can't she go and win something at Christmas and be let down and, and come back for this? And I know Tom is very confident Henry de Romhead's going to bounce back to form and sweep all before him on the first day. But my thought would be if, if you have a dip and then it's a short dip and you come back to form, then that's a little bit of a bug. I'd just be concerned that there's obviously something not quite right and it's gone on from the start of the season. And as you said, it hasn't got an awful lot better. So it's too much guesswork for me to want to get stuck into her. She's rated 142. Burning Victory and Stormy Island rated 150 each. They've both won at the course. Burning Victory won fortuitously the, the gosh and triumph hurdle. Um, Stormy Island uh, won the Rao Keel. That form's worked out quite well. Um, they'll give their running their good, tough, hardy mares um, that'll cope with a bit of soft ground from a yard in form. They've shown themselves to be in, in fine health this year. So 
I'd probably take those two against the field, but it's not an exciting race. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm very much with you with Burning Victory. She's got some options um, in other places. She's got 145 for the likes of the Coral Cup. So it just depends where they where they turn up with her. But I, yeah, she was slightly back to her, her best last time when, when she was winning. At least she comes in with a bit of winning form underneath her. And um, and she's uh, and she's obviously won here at Cheltenham as well. I'll, I'll head to you, Tom, just to uh, quickly finish up the mayor's hurdle. Yeah, well, if Henry de Bromhead wins the three previous races, which I hope he will, then I might be going in on Tell Me Something Girl. Um, but she's not the not the selection here. Um, I'm going to take a chance on Mrs. Milner. Now, maybe I said this on, on Saturday when I was on Sky, a heart overhead decision. And uh, Daryl Williams, no, John Blanc actually said, you're a very practical and logical man. I wouldn't expect you to go for heart overhead. Well, there are occasions where you have to do that. Um, and last year, I was all in on the boss's Oscar in the Potemps. Uh, he was my best bet from a long way out, and he got beat by Mrs. Milner. So I've kind of had a soft spot for her ever since. Some people would be put off by that horse if they beat their best bet, but uh, I think she was really smart. Um, I don't really like the trip here for her, but you know, sometimes you've got to you've got to take that uh, little risk that. She'll be good enough over this distance. She's got great Cheltenham form. She's had two runs here, finished second, and then one, obviously, in the Potemps final. I think this is probably going to be the seasonal target. Paul Nolan is very good when he targets horses at races. I think there's one coming up in the Boodles as well, which we'll touch on in a short while, that I think has got a great chance for Paul Nolan. Um, so hopefully Mrs. Milner will win here. But as I say, if Henry de Bromhead has a, a very good afternoon at this point, I will probably be uh, getting the wheelbarrow out for the favourite. Okay, well, we'll wait and see. Yeah, interesting with Silk Milner coming back for this trip. She did win earlier on in the season over two miles six. So quite a shrewd man, Paul Nolan. So we'll, he's probably been thinking this up a little bit. And she is 13 to one as it stands with SBK. So not a pretty decent prize for a former festival winner. Okay, we'll head on into the Boodles, as we mentioned, the Fred Winter Juvenile Handicap Hurdle, a truly wonderful race to solve. We had an 80 to one winner of this last year. And in the last 10 years, only three have been shorter than 25 to one. So I know one man in particular who just loves unearthing something at a mad price. Um, in fact, there was a period in this podcast where we started to call you the wild Ross Miller. So I hope you've unearthed something really spectacular for us here. It's all yours. Uh, no, I'm afraid not just. I've, it's not a race I've looked at in great depth. I just think ground is important and none more so than for the, for the juveniles that have been coming off the flat. So if it's soft, I'll look at this race entirely differently than if it's if it's good to soft. I think you could perhaps see if it's good to soft, something that's shown absolutely no form at all through the winter on proper winter ground, popping up and running out of its out of its skin. Um, one that I'm interested in at the moment is Luna Power. Um, strong finisher at Punchtown last time, beating Iberic to soil uh, five lengths um, from last year's winning trainer. Just sort of had a nice profile and it's run some solid races and got plenty of experience. Um, so he'd be on my radar, but a, a, a more in-depth look closer to the time when I know what the ground is. Okay, fair enough. 18 to 1 to give Nomi back-to-back victories in this race after after Jeff Kidder's stock win. And uh, look, the, the Irish have a very good record in this race, James. It's the, it's, it's the race that they've done well in, but Paul Nichols has done well in as well. He's managed to find a few. Uh, here I spoke to Nicky Henderson when I did his interview. He said this is... One race that we won't win, uh, he said, uh, and that's uh, reflected in the betting market and Gaelic Warrior. Thoughts on the horse that has not even ran in the UK or Ireland, where he's based, uh, coming into this race with this rating of 129. I know that Ross had a few thoughts on this as well, but it's it, it's difficult for the handicapper to assess a horse of this likes. And it's, it's just, I just think that's completely false price to offer off a horse who's, who's, who's not even... Uh, run at all for Willie Mullins. Yeah, well, he ran in, in the very early three-year-old juvenile hurdles over at Ortoid, a, a pretty high-class contest. But um, I did remember reading on social media, there's a few guys that, that followed the French racing quite closely, um, a guy called Marmaduke Jeeps, I think it is, on, on, on Twitter. And, and he said that Gaelic Warrior and Porticello were the only two horses in the spring over in France that actually ran decent figures that have come over to, to Britain or Ireland. And I wondered what Gaelic Warrior was going to do because we hadn't seen him at all, they got one two nine. They've kept that mark. They've not run him. Um, they want to ruin it. He's had the free runs. James Reevely rode him over in France. Look, five two is far too short, or whatever price he is at the moment. But he could be very good, and he might not be far behind their, their main triumph forces. But against that, you've just said the big prices that win the the, the Boodles and the Fred Winter. Um, I'm going to go for a British horse in the fact that 
we didn't see what he could have done in the finale um, for Harry Fry, forever blessed. He basically got wiped out. Um, I think it was Sky Cutter, uh, Phil Kirby's horse, and ultimately Sean Byrne pulled him up in, in a race where there were not many hurdles or jump. But he looked very good at Foss Last and Sandown. At one, two, four on the back of that blip in the finale. If he'd run well in that race, he would have been one, three, five and probably be heading towards a triumph. So I thought he could be well treated of 124. They've kept him fresh. He's got a flat pedigree. So the fact he did well at Sandown on pretty soft ground and one at Foss Last on soft ground, it shows you handles these ground conditions and he might actually improve, like Ross said about the flat breads or the flat X flat runners on and a better surface. So for me, he's an each way angle into a race which looks like it's going to be dominated by potentially a very well handicapped horse and Gaelic warrior. Yeah, forever, forever blessed. Definitely got that flat, flat pedigree. About twenty-five to one at stands. Um, it's gone down a few pounds for that uh, that run last time, where he just couldn't really show his showing at all. Uh, Tom, as I said, this is an extremely difficult race to 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 work out. Um, it always boggles me year after year, and there's normally something pretty well handicapped from the Irish uh, that's just sort of been running decently without. Uh, lighting anyone's fire otherwise they'll be in something like the triumph what have you what have you picked out well firstly i think we have to oppose gaelic warrior he could win by 15 lengths but as everyone's already mentioned he's a terrible price so you've got to take him on um the two i like in here are champion green and hms seahorse now hms seahorse is the selection another for paul nolan he's beautifully bred he's by galileo out of a group place horse called after who was in training with aiden o'brien um he looked pretty labored on the flat with aiden o'brien um earlier in his career then he moved to paul nolan went hurdling he was purchased for just 24k i don't know what the expectations were with him but he just turned out to to be quite a sharp um, prospect i think um he's had three hurdling starts he made a huge mid-race move when he finished third on his hurdling debut behind a 135 rated winner um then he showed real guts to win last time out um, beating a horse who's won earlier this week, in fact. I like the way he's shaped. He, given he was so close to horse rate 135, I think a mark of 128 is extremely lenient. There's further progression to come. As I say, beautifully bred. He's got loads of ability and he could be the uh, joker in the pack here. I definitely think he's a much more attractive price than if you want to get involved on this favourite. Yeah, 12 to 1. Paul Nolan again. So between this horse and Mrs Milner could be... A good uh, half an hour or so. And yeah, full uh, Colts still as well. We don't see, it's been a while since we've seen many of them. And full brother to Armory. So yeah, as you say, beautifully bred. So uh, HMS Seahorse for Tom at 12 to 1. I'm going to throw in a, a, a former Irish trained horse in Bell X1, who's made a move over to uh, the Paul Nichols team. Was with um, was over in Ireland as a stead where he was a uh, multiple winner on over hurdles and on the flat. Not a bad flat horse at all. I found it very difficult to split the top two in this, uh, guys. Statler and Ron Wilfred. Uh, there's not too much you can separate them by. I just think Ron Wilfred might be the one that could settle and travel a little bit better than Statler. But I I know because I've already seen that there are a few the few of uh, you have all got the same opinions about one horse in particular. I'll come at Ross to you first. Um, Statler, I, I know what you're going to say. Is he the right favourite? Yeah, I think he is. Um, I, I think he's a, a, the, the strongest favourite of the of the opening day, um, given that we don't know quite the makeup of the Supreme. Um, he he looked thoroughly slow over hurdles, and he actually showed a bit more speed at the start of this season over fences. You know, he had a bit of pace around two mile five. Um, didn't jump great last time grounded out showed good stamina good toughness I thought he got the job done well and in a race for the for the amateurs um sadly the Irish have the best horses according to Henrietta Knight they have the best trainers I don't buy that but they do have the best amateur jockeys largely because they get more opportunity um so Patrick Mullins you know Jamie Codd these are the guys you need to look at Patrick Mullins has had this marked out as his uh, National Hunt chase horse for the season. Um, it'll do for me. I think he's he's got gears. He's got stamina. He jumps well enough. I think he'll get the job done. Yeah, but uh, Patrick Mullins loves this race. They've missed they missed it last year. They weren't allowed due, due to COVID the amateurs to run in this race. But I can agree with you more in, in terms of the quality of the amateurs over in over in Ireland. Um, James, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you've basically got a match, I think, really. You're going to go with the real experience that Ramwell Fred has, which is a big bonus uh, against that. I think Statler's a better horse. 
and Ranmard Freddy does keep coming runner up. I think it'll be between the two of them. I think it won't be much between them up the hill, but uh, owner Ronnie Bartlett likes to win the National Hunt Chase. And you know that Patrick, at the start of every campaign, he finds a, a novice chase in the yard that he wants to run in this race. And it hasn't actually come off quite as well as Patrick would like, um, just a couple of wins in the last 10 years. But you know that one of them has always been earmarked for him. Uh, and for me, that's obviously Statler. And I think I concur with Ross completely. He's looked a little bit sharper over the bigger obstacles. And it's been a long-term project, hasn't it? He wasn't quite quick enough to win a bumper. He ran well in a lot of races last year over hurdles. Not probably a little bit disappointing because he was favourite at the, the festival, wasn't he? Um, and Vanillier beat him. He only finished fourth. But I think the bigger obstacles put him in a better light. And he can certainly reverse the form of Vanillier. And it is a match, but I just think he's better than Ron Wadfred. Well, I'm, I'm going to take both of you guys on. I'll see what Tom says as well, but I just like the way that Ron Wilfred settles, he travels, he's got a lot more experience, I think, but he is yet to travel out of Ireland. Uh, Statler was beaten pretty uh, convincingly by Vanillier last year. He was a, another horse that isn't out of it. Derek O'Connor has been booked for his ride as well, and he was pretty confident about him. But Tom, are you, are you with James and Russell, or are you against him for, for what... What's a, is a, a pretty compelling case brought by both of them? Yeah, I, I'm with them. I really love Statler in this race. He's Rathwinden 2.0. Rathwinden obviously won this race in 2018, but he's a better jumper and he's got more ability. I can't see him being beat. I, I hope this will be the perfect end to day one of the Cheltenham Festival and we can move on to day two with money in the bank. That is day one. Um, before we get to our nap and our next best of uh, the first day, this Thursday, uh, only a couple of days away now, uh, the 10th of March, if you deposit £10 with SBK, you get £50 in free bets. For new customers only, you've got to be 18 and over, but that's a great uh, way to uh, get a, a couple of free bets ahead of the Cheltenham Festival and uh, to, to start the punting well for day one. Uh, so, yes, Naps and Express uh, with plenty of selections, plenty of uh, confidence behind a few of these horses. So I'll go to James first. Yeah, Edward Stone's my nap for day one, purely because we, we know that that's where he's going to be heading uh, to the Aussie Arkle. I think the Irish chasers are average at best in the two-mile division, and he's dominated the English runners, and I really like watching their offence this year, so he's a nap. Uh, next best is Sir Gerhard. Wherever he goes, Bannymore or Supreme, he's nearly one of my nap at a meeting. It's just we don't know where he's going yet, but I think he's good enough to go with whatever option Willie Mullins chooses. OK, fair enough. We'll, we'll watch him brief with him. Ross, for you, Napa next best, please. Uh, Napa is Dysart Dynamo in the Supreme. I think he's the best horse in the race. Um, and the next best is in the ultimate, Ben Dundee. I'm quite sweet on him off of just a pound higher mark than he'd have in Ireland. Okay, Dysart Dynamo, best horse in the Supreme. Um, interesting uh, selections there. T Tom Collins, uh, on to you. Yeah, the Napa is Statler in the National Hunt Chase at 5.30. Um, I think he's the most talented horse and will definitely stay the trip. And the next best is HMS Seahorse at a double figure price in the Boodles at 450. I think a mark of 128 is plenty fair enough. Uh, I'm going to go against both against you with that. I think that the English will have a good day on day one and, and the Scottish. Um, my nap is Constitution Hill for so many reasons. Been talking about him all year. So it's going to be a big moment come 1.30 on, uh, on Tuesday if, if he does. Uh, he might start my week off well, terribly, but that is my nap. And my next best is Cork Rambler for the Lucinda Russell team in the Ultima. Um, so that is day one of the Cheltenham Festival. Mm -hmm.